hope you're back from a refreshing break. So now um, in this next, next section, we'll continue where we left off in the previous one. And Should previously we, we were talking about parallelization and these cooking uh, metaphors. Should should we make the note about notes.code refine? Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so so yeah, before we start, uh so good uh mentioned that it was done in the notes, uh the collaborative notes. So previously we were using this uh, service called HackMD for these notes. Now we have our own uh server running this. Uh, the technology is pretty much the same, but sometimes we sleep up and we call it HackMD when we should call it collaborative nodes. And uh, so so that's on us, but we, it just, you could just get so used to, to the name and that you start using it all the time. So so when we are... It's conveniently it, short. <laughs> yes. So now we'll try to say notes all the time when we talk about the, the collaborative collaborative notes but sometimes if we mention hackmd that means the collaborative notes we try to keep the uh the syntax more clear so that uh you know what to refer to but these collaborative notes these are the the main place to uh ask questions yes so uh immediately forgot it uh so yes but back to the topic uh of this session so we were previously talking about pots, pans, pasta, all kinds of stuff. And the question usually comes when people come to uh, HPC clusters, and we are talking about this parallelizations and all sorts of things, is that people widely might not know what their program does or how big their program is, like what is the size of the program. And usually when when people come and ask us what sort of what what size is the program? If they don't know what is the size, we try to give um, these kinds of like handy tips uh, that can be used to to like estimate the the size of the program. So you don't need to necessarily know exactly what the program size is, but you can like give ballpark estimates, and these usually make it a lot easier to to like uh, uh, decide on what sort of resources. Uh, you're going to be asking. So we'll talk about resources in a second. But first off, like, why should you care? Um, well, there's a couple of things. So first off, uh, the cluster system or the SPC systems that we've been talking about, they're shared systems. And they're shared based on your usage. So, so how much you use uh, depends uh, or changes uh, how how much resources you get in the future. There is a, like a cutoff point of like, you. it's usually calculated like a few weeks or something that your uh, priority bounces back up. But if you use a lot of resources at a certain time, uh, you your priority in the in the queue with respect to the other users uh, will, will start to drop. And, uh, and the bigger drops you request, the more it drops. Yes. So, so or the, the more resources in total you request. Yes, so and getting a getting a sensible size for your jobs and a sensible um estimation on how much resources you need is good for future use because otherwise you, you might end up waiting a, a lot longer than would have been necessary. Definitely. So so this is the the so it helps you. So first off, the second thing is that uh, it can help you organize your work. So if you know that how long something takes, you know that okay, I I can make this uh, in in one week, or I can do this in in one month. Or if you notice that okay, like if I calculate this, it will take me like a year to calculate. Then you know that okay, maybe I need to do some optimization or modify the code a bit so that I can do it. Uh, so or try to run it in parallel. Yes, yes, to <laughs> parallelize it. Like, or you can also notice that. Okay, this part it doesn't really matter as long as I get it done once, and and you can let it be uh, inefficient if it's if it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And the third thing uh, is that like if you have some estimate uh, of how big your program is, and you uh, suddenly you realize that uh, that the program doesn't 
match that estimate. Like for example, if you estimate that the the pasta will take eight minutes to cook, and suddenly the pasta took sixty minutes to cook, you might wonder like what's happening, or like what was wrong, like. This didn't match my expectation. So maybe the burner was such a low level heat burner that it doesn't boil the water. So it was like lukewarm water and the pasta. Or was... your pasta was a lot thicker than you expected. Yeah, something like that. So it might be related to, to the data, it might be related to the problem at hand, or it might be that you're using like a really crappy burner or you didn't like you you, you instead of using all four burners, you only used one burner in so this is quite common. So you might there might be some uh, like cha change in the in the like you didn't request the resources that you were using or planning on using, and and in these cases uh, having some estimate really helps you get like a, uh, get something that you can verify then based on the the results. So it's always good to estimate first and then modify the estimation based on what sort of things you get. So, it can also help if you have, uh, for example, a small problem that you're running and you have a slightly bigger problem that you're running and you expect that this is scaling linearly. But suddenly the time that it takes is more like an exponential function of it. Uh, you know, you can easily see, okay, well, I seemingly do have some exponential runtime in here. So um, a really huge problem with the same program probably won't run. Because it's just there's just not enough resources for it. Yes, and then you can decide on better algorithm or something. But yeah. now, Thomas, uh, when we talk about resources, what resources are we talking about, really? Um, well, the, the two main factors on the cluster are CPUs and memory, um, and GPUs if you need them. So, how much CPUs does a program use? How much memory? Does my program use? That's kind of the questions that, uh, or the the resources that are most well that that the cluster essentially limits. Yes. So so but like the amount of burners and the amount of like right. like these kinds of things you cannot really change because they are hardware dependent. And and then there's a time dimension that how long do you want the pasta to cook basically? So you can reserve the kitchen for an hour. But the pasta takes eight minutes to cook, and then, like, you had a reservation for an hour, so it's going to be empty for the rest of the hour. Uh, so these kinds of like estimations, when you estimate time, memory, and and CPUs and GPUs, of course, if you're using those, it's it's good to know uh, what resources you're going to be needing. And uh, one mention here: uh, while if your program ends earlier. Um, you will only be kind of built for the time that you have used to actually be running. Um, your runtime is probably the most important factor because um, the manager tries to push you in into a into the right place. And for a very long running program, it just might not find a good place for it for quite yes. some time. So, so the, the queue will estimate your time based on what you tell it. Uh, tell it. We'll talk about how you request these resources later. But later. Let's let's uh, try to get an estimation. Like like okay, so how do do you estimate like CPU uh, uh, CPU and RAM size? So the first good measuring stick is to use your own computer. So so that's like have you run the program on on your computer? So that's quite simple, like, like estimation. Uh, so. Uh, and and for these, like, there's some ballpark numbers you can say. Like, not every computer is the same, but they are about like a comp modern laptop is about like four CPUs and 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's about like the ballpark. So you can use that in an estimation of how big is your laptop. And and the desktop computer might be like double that, so it might have eight CPUs and 32 gigabytes of memory. Like if we are talking about like. Uh, performance desktops uh, in universities usually but so this is like this kind of a ballpark thing that you can you can say that okay like if it's if it fit into my uh, laptop i know that it it fit into these resources so so this well like if if it didn't run on my laptop then you know that okay maybe i need more than this so you can give like uh you can get a measuring stick and uh like a this kind of like a uh, 
range of, right. of values that you can fit the job into. And you might even know um, why it didn't run on your laptop. Uh, it was it a, was it you ran you ran out of memory, or was it it took just ages? Yes. Um, in the first case, well, you need more memory than that than what your machine has. In the second case, um, you probably need to check how my how many CPUs did it actually use. So did it use more than one? And if it did, then you can think, okay, well. Maybe requesting it more CPUs than my machine has will speed it up. Yes, and uh, like uh, to get get like a another estimation of like how big are typically like the compute nodes in in the clusters. They are usually like about eight laptops, so so they have like to up up from thirty two to up to hundred and twenty eight processors, and they have a uh, from like. 128 gigabytes of RAM to to like 500 gigabytes of RAM. Those are like the typical compute nodes that we're talking about. So like you could say that one server is about two desktops or like four uh, desktops. There's still oh, four desktops. Yeah, yeah. there's a <laughs> mistake here. Yeah, uh, four no desktops problem. or no uh, eight laptops. So so yeah, that's about the ballpark numbers that you can use to to estimate. Uh, but if you want to get a better estimate, you could use your task manager. So I'll be uh, showing like the task manager here in my my Linux laptop. So you can see that there's like a constant usage based on Zoom and all of the other programs, Firefoxes and everything that I have opened. Uh, but now that I'm running, a, I'll, I'll run a small sample program that we'll be using in the cluster later on. So Thomas, if you want to explain what happens when I when I run this. Yeah. Um, so essentially, what you see in the top panel is that there's, well, initially one and then a different CPU starting to run. So essentially, what this shows is there is one thing, one CPU that is being used here. There's never any additional CPUs that are being being used. So this is a program that only makes use of one CPU. So if this would be even if you even if well if you want to run this to even more um uh with even more trials it doesn't make any sense to add additional cpus because it can't use them yes so this is quite common so even if you get like the first ballpark estimate of like okay i will get all of what my laptop is i will get that from the cluster i will get a similar amount of resources that is the like the first ballpark you could use but the second estimate, like if you want to improve the first estimate, would be check like what happens in your laptop or your machine while you're running uh, the code. So this this is a very simple way of, of doing that. You don't need any profiling, anything like that. Uh, one other estimate you can use is that does your uh, does your laptop get really hot, or does it uh, does it start to like does, do the fans start to whine like constantly? So if it does. Like if you cannot hold it in your lap anymore, that might be suggesting that it uses all of the resources in the laptop. But if it doesn't, if you can like still uh, open browser windows and something while your code is running, you it might be that it's just running something small in the background. But like the, using well, these only of, when using one of the CPUs. Yes, yes, because it it can cool itself off. But but like using some of these kinds of estimates, they give you like a ballpark where you can start from. Like these are very simple tricks that you can use to like say to yourself, okay, like this is about the size of my program. So, so the, now that we have talked about the, like the RAM and, and the CPU sizes, we could uh, talk about like how, how should you should think of them in, in when you are going to the uh, cluster. So, so usually the cluster itself thinks of these as these slots. So, so like every like if you have a, some amount of memory in a, in a computer, and you have a, some amount of CPUs, what the Q system itself thinks about is that these kinds of like how big of a like a block of of memory and and a CPU is needed by by a certain job, and and it thinks of them as these like blocks. And nowadays like a, based on like economical reasons so it's not like a nature nature law or anything like that 
uh, the slot size is about one CPU per four gigabytes of RAM. So so this is about like the size of a uh, like a, a typical like this kind of a uh, unit. Yeah, yeah, unit, natural measurement unit in, in the cluster. So so your laptop would be four, your desktop would be eight, and a server might be like a compute server where we uh, will be running the codes. They will be like thirty two slots. So so this is something that you can use to like think of your job in in terms of so it's like a like a meter of a cluster. So instead of like how much you how how long something is, you can think of like what is the slot size basically. And if your job is something that it it needs, for example, four CPUs, but it only uses one gigabyte of RAM, it still needs four slots because it needs four CPUs. But if your job is so that it uses one CPU and 10 gigabytes of RAM, it needs three slots because it needs to have memory more than eight gigabytes and less than 12 gigabytes. So it's like it needs about three slots. And and this is important when you're talking about like this parallelism within your jobs. So so because you are already requesting this amount of resources. So especially if you're using a lot of memory, it's also a good idea to try to parallelize the code or reduce the memory requirements so that you can either reduce the number of slots that you need or you can uh, use all of the CPUs allocated basically for you. Of course, there's some jobs like like even if you request this amount of memory, there might be the queue might be able to fit like a job such as this to use a few of those CPUs, but it makes it harder for the queue. It makes it harder for the queue to to fit stuff into the into the cluster. So it's but uh, the, what I would say is um, don't worry if you are if you have something that only has one CPU but you need quite a lot of memory request one CPU and quite a lot of memory instead of requesting 10 CPUs and uh, and 40 gigabytes of memory because it still leaves the resources open. They might not be usable, but they still might be. It, depend, it depends on how how other jobs are um, running on the cluster. Yes. So don't, don't be uh, afraid that a, uh, that's something that doesn't fit to these slots will mess with the cluster. It's just something to that's kind of the natural unit for the cluster yes. um, that you can think of. Yes, this is a very good addition. So so now that we have talked about like the, uh, the RAM and CPU, let's talk about the execution time. So what Thomas already mentioned is that a good measuring stick would be to use, again, your own computer. So if it took you some time to run on your computer, you might assume that it takes the same amount of time in, in the uh, cluster computer. But sometimes this isn't the case. So Thomas, do you want to explain why well, it might? Essentially, what I say is, um, most most modern laptops or desktop machines have slightly faster CPUs than the, the cluster. That's partially because sometimes uh, some of the cluster resources might be a bit older, and also because uh, the cluster resources are um, more for efficient, more yeah, for also energy efficiency. And the fastest uh, fastest that you can get is commonly not the most energy efficient, but the advantage of the cluster is it has more, so it can do more stuff at the same time. Um, so you might experience that uh, something that ran an hour on your machine takes an hour and five minutes on the cluster, or even an hour and ten minutes. Yes, um, but the but the main benefit, of course, is that if, but, if during that time you burned your lap while having your laptop on your lap. If it's running on the cluster, it's not burning your lap anymore. You so, can so, work on. Yes. So you can like yeah. you can transfer it into energy efficient CPUs that, that then do it on yeah. the on the cluster side. But but if you like if you haven't finished what you wanted to do, like if you if you started to run a program on your computer but you didn't manage to finish it. It took you like a day. Uh, like it, it's going on and on. You, you don't know like when it's going to end, and you you just want to know. Uh, there's also tricks to do that. You can estimate the runtime uh, in m multiple ways. And the easiest way is to is to check if your program is this kind of like iterative program. So if your program does something more than once, so <laughs> like. 
for example, like physics code, they usually have, you might have a grid or something and you, you integrate like some physics in equations in time steps. So you do like one time step at a time until you have done all the, all of the time steps and you reach some end time. That That is an, like an iterative thing. Or you might have like a Monte Carlo simulate, uh, sorry, like a Markov chain simulation where you, you do like, you bounce from a state to a state and you go through a so like some Essentially, yeah. yeah. And every time you calculate roughly the same equations, which will take roughly the same time for each step in your chain. Yeah, and, so, and like deep learning where you do training in epochs, like you do like this kind of epochs. So anything that, that, that does something more than once, in those kinds of situations, you can only run it few iterations, and then you can just like estimate that it will just be, the, like you can just multiply with the number of iterations uh, as long as you know what time it took to run one step. So most likely these kinds of programs, it takes some time to start up, which might be different than each, like the iteration length. But if you let it run for like, I don't know, like 10 iterations, and then you divide the runtime by 10, so you get about the time of a one iteration, and then you multiply it by 10,000 or whatever is the overall iteration time you want to do, then you can get an estimate of, okay, like I expect it to run this long. Uh, and and this of course applies to a situation where you have like multiple uh, parameters or multiple uh, different data sets you want to go through. So for example, if you need to if you need to cook ten different kinds of pasta, if you cook one kind of pasta, you know that okay, it's probably ten times this this what it take took to uh, do this one pasta. Of course, there might be like in some cases uh, the analysis times might differ based on like data set or parameters oh. or something but but usually you so, could estimate it like this Simo, there is a question in the um in the notes um asking what ha what or how would you estimate the uh runtime for an iterative progr process that you don't know how many iterations it will take like a breadth first search in a graph hmm that's a good question uh that's a very good question an interesting one but but I would say for for that for that search for example, um, you you have an upper limit, you have an upper limit, and that is going through the whole graph. Mm. So if you take that as an as your maximum number of iterations, it's very unlikely that it would need that much, but that could be yeah. your maximum number of iterations. And also, I would say that often, like you have some sort of like a tolerance or something calculated, like. Like you have a tolerance, like when do you stop, like a stopping condition, but you also have like a hard code at maximum, like when do you stop, like if you haven't found a solution, let's just like stop here because this is not going anywhere. So so you usually have like, you let's say in the code, if you have like a while loop, it's usually a good idea to have some sort of like, okay, like get me out of here if I get stuck on this infinitely. So if you have like a bug or if you have some sort of like, a problem that optimization problem that doesn't have a solution or something like that, or you can't find it in in like reasonable time. In those cases, it might be good to the program itself add some some sort of like a failsafe, and so that you know that it won't get larger than this. Uh, but of course, like it's very hard to tell. It's very hard to tell beforehand. But you can still calculate what it takes to do one iteration and then. Uh, expand upon that like you can assume that the maximum number of iterations that i'm willing to wait is like ten thousand, and one iteration takes like a second so the minimum maximum is like ten thousand seconds uh then i think we time. should go on because we are heading towards the end of the time yeah so so the last section last thing to mention is that um uh, you can also like when you're talking about programs if you like this question that was asked relates to this as well so that if you have a problem that you you don't know like you couldn't you could run let's say the easier problem on your laptop and you want to run a harder problem in a cluster and you don't know how how long it will take on the cluster you can usually try to like calculate the ratio of the easier problem to the bigger problem and then estimate based on that so for example, if you have like a matrix calculation thing that uses matrix calculations, you might like if you solve with the 
n times n matrix. And the problem you want to solve is like m times m. So in this case, it would be like four times bigger, this uh, problem. Uh, you might want to estimate that the runtime uh, is is uh, like four times as big. So so in, in this case, because the, like the big problem is uh, as big as like these four smaller problems. Of course, this is not rea really what will happen. So because the algorithms and stuff like that, they don't necessarily scale in this sense, but it's a better estimate than having no estimate at all, because then you can ad adapt the estimate. Like it's still better to get some sort of estimate. Like if something happens, what is my assumption? What will happen? Because then you can like, you can refine it and you will get more intimate with your program. You know, know it a bit better because you suddenly uh, got some more information. And it's very important, like uh, like this graph example, it's very important to spot if you have a problem that is like a traveling salesman problem, which is like, or exponential scaling problem that that like you have permutations and you want to like a million permutations and that sort of thing. You can easily get into a situation where it scales like, like you suddenly get like millions and millions of, uh, of parameters you need to do and, and suddenly, uh, you you cannot it's anymore just not solve computable. It. Yeah. yeah. So so in um, those cases there there are ways of doing it, but it's good to like to, uh, find out if your pro problem is such a problem. I want to mention I think one last thing. Um, the resources that you request on the cluster, the mo the hardest re hardest barrier kind of is the runtime. If you go over your runtime, um, it the job will be will be killed uh, and it will just end um you can't really go over over the number of assigned cpus um if it ca could use more cpus it would probably run f run quicker but um as long as it has cpus it is running and there is uh, it is doing something and for memory uh, the cluster is relatively flexible Essentially, what that means is, as long as there is memory on the on the free memory on the node uh, that you are running on, it will try it will t give you more memory unless there is uh, until it reaches the point that there is no memory left, even if it's over your requirement, uh, and then it will essentially um, look okay which job is violating their constraints the most, and that job will be killed. Yes. And I'll mention that like we are here talking about like like the general first estimations that you can give but we'll be talking later how to monitor like how do you well, after you have run this first estimation run how do you then monitor and adapt on that estimation we'll be talking about that and also about how do you actually request these uh, resources but this is mainly just to give a motivation that you should constantly have this kind of like feedback loop of like, okay, based on what your jobs did, what are you going to do in the future? Because that will help you and that will help, uh, yeah, that will help you and it will help everybody else as well because the queue will be uh, more compact, like. But I think yeah, that we are essentially about it. finished here. You can read the whole text uh, again if you're interested. Should we switch to HackMD to let people see the kind of questions? You move to the notes. Or the notes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll show here. Yes. So as you can see, this time there's lots of different questions here. People asking about what happens if you underestimate the resources. Um, what happens if your job is killed? For the most part, you can read this yourself. I think everything is answered pretty well there. Um, I think the last question that's on there will be discussed in a bit more detail. I think I the, when was it? When was the data? Which one? The data? Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow. At least tomorrow, tomorrow. We'll talk about data storage and how that affects things. I guess as these questions sort of show, there's a lot of different things that all come together here and make this quite a, like there's just so many moving parts in doing HPC kind of work. And, and also one one thing that I 
wanted to mention was this what Simo and Thomas were talking about now is that it is largely like an empirical question that you you try out things and uh, first you try out on your own computer or your own laptop and then you go to the cluster and you try out things there and you kind of check that like I tried this oh it crashed maybe if I add a little bit more memory oh now it didn't crash so yeah it's uh it's in that sense it's not it doesn't you don't have to be too scared about like trying out things and because that's how it, uh, it is what I what I would say is um if you have a job if you have jobs that are relatively short let's say an hour or less um be uh, I, I would be a bit more conservative than if I have a job that I know that takes four days then I would probably just add a bit more memory for example um just to be uh, on the safe side that yeah okay I'm requesting a bit too much and I know for for the whole time and I will be build kind of for it but uh I'd rather have that thing being done after four days than after three days crushing uh being killed because it did go over memory mm. yeah okay but I think we are giving the floor to Damo and Richard